afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this special Policy Pitch webinar brought to you by the Grattan Institute and the State Library of Victoria. My name is Paul Austin. I'm the editor at Grattan Institute, and it's my pleasure to be joined this afternoon by three experts on the issue of female workforce participation. First, Grattan Institute CEO, Danielle Wood, the Director of Tax at the Melbourne University Law School, Professor Miranda Stewart, and Emma Walsh, who is CEO of the Social Enterprise Parents at Work. As I welcome our panellists, I'd like on their behalf to acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which we are meeting today. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Over the next hour or so, we'll be exploring any number of questions about female workforce participation, including the central issues of childcare and parental leave policies and a whole lot more besides. I'll be asking questions of our panel of experts, but I'll also be putting questions to the panel from you, our audience members. There's a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Can I start with you, Danielle, because you have just this week released a major new Grattan report called Cheaper Childcare, a practical plan to boost female workforce participation. Tell us about that report, Danielle, and tell us about your practical plan. Thank you, and just a great moment for my internet to cut out, so hopefully everyone can, can hear me. Um, I, I should, fantastic. I should also say um, a big thank you to my co-authors on the report, Kate Griffith and Owen Emsley, for their fantastic work, as uh, well as any number of Grattan interns. I think we've decided the collective noun for interns are a luminescence of interns, so thank you to our, our very luminescent contributors. Um, so look, the plan, uh, I'll provide a little bit of background to the plan, perhaps. Um, and a lot of people have been talking about um, female workforce participation as a potential big economic driver for a long time. Um, certainly our uh, old CEO, John Daly, did a report about five years ago, looking at where you know, there were opportunities in Australia for improvements in growth and living standards. And, and he sort of picked out female, increasing female workforce participation as one of the, the, the top three opportunities. Um, so this has been kicking around for a long time. This has been talked about for a long time, including by uh, the other the other panelists today. Um, and the exercise that we went through was to, um, to essentially look at the current data. And I'm going to quickly share my screen. So I love to put up some charts. Got it. Uh, fantastic. So when we sort of had a look at how we fared internationally, but you have quite high rates of female workforce participation by international standards, but we have really high rates of part-time work amongst women compared to other developed countries. Um, and really, particularly for women with young children um, in sort of heterosexual couple households, this 1.5 earner model is the norm. So father works full time, mother works two to three days a week, but it's not necessarily the case in other countries. So. What we think of um, as sort of normal here, it, you know, you see lots of different patterns overseas. So we were interested in why that was and, and what the barriers might be. And what we identified is the key barrier. Um, there are a number, but the, the one that we really honed in on was high out-of-pocket childcare costs. So we looked at something that um, this term was first coined by KPMG a couple of years ago, which is the workforce disincentive rate. So this idea that if you are in a couple where there's a primary earner working full time, a secondary earner working part time, still overwhelmingly the women, the woman in the heterosexual couple, um, if they look at increasing their hours, workforce disincentive comes about from out of pocket childcare costs and the interaction of those costs with tax and welfare settings. And when we looked at the, the sort of the size of those disincentives, we were blown away by how significant they were, particularly for working day four and five. Um, so if we have a look at this chart, and I realise there's a lot going on here, but we focus in perhaps on this, um, both parents that would be earning 60,000 full-time equivalent, uh, if they were both working full-time, uh, fathers working full-time, mothers three days a week. If she were to go from three to four days, she would lose about 90% of her income from the fourth day in that combination of tax, childcare costs, and clawback of family tax benefits. That means she'd effectively be working for $2 an hour. Um, if 
she were to go from four to five days a week, she would lose 100%. That is, she would be working for nothing on the fifth day. And when you see those numbers, um, the 1.5 earner model suddenly looks like a pretty logical response to the incentives that are built into the system. And the big driver of those workforce and disincentive rates, there's a lot of things going on behind them. But the big driver right across the income distribution is the out-of-pocket cost for childcare, which is the yellow component um, at the top of those bars. So you can do a lot of things to try and improve these incentives, but the single biggest thing that you can do is to bring down out-of-pocket childcare costs. Um, so our plan goes to that point. How do you actually do this? Um, there are a lot of different things you can do, and we, we might flash out some alternatives, and we certainly looked at a number of alternatives in the report. But the one we ended up settling on was an idea that you work within the current system, which is a means tested system, bringing up the base subsidy so that for low income families, rather than covering 85%, the government's covering 95% of their childcare costs. And then you have a less aggressive taper. So your childcare subsidy does cut out as family income grows, but it does so less aggressively so the mother can you know, take on more hours, take on more work without previous days of work. It's also quite a significant simplification of the current system, <laughs> removing some of the, you know, the weird features like the cap, which is uh, much hated by parents um, and doesn't really serve much of a policy purpose. Um, so that plan um, would cost about $5 billion. We estimate that uh, it would boost workforce participation amongst second earners by about 13%. Uh, and that would lead to an overall boost to the economy of about 11 billion. Um, so there are some really significant returns to this. That's before you even talk about um, some of the other benefits around um, increased exposure to early learning and care for, for children, um, long-term benefits to um, female career progression. Um, so we think this is a really, this is a policy that provides a really good economic kicker and, and also leads to broader social benefits. Um, so that is that sort of the centerpiece of the plan. Miranda, can I ask you, please, what do you think of the Grattan plan for childcare reform? And am I right that you think Australia should go beyond Danielle's plan and actually introduce free universal childcare? Um, uh, well, thanks for those questions, Paul, and uh, thanks for having me on the panel. It's uh, great to be here. Um, Grattan's produced a really, a really important and interesting report, uh, full of really good data uh, and wonderful charts, which Grattan usually does. Um, so the, the question is a is a question of degree, really. You know, we we currently have a, t uh, a fairly tightly means tested. Um, family payment system and childcare system uh, with our progressive income tax. So when we put all those, those, those things together, uh, that we get these, the squeeze on especially days four and five that Danielle illustrated. Um, in my view, uh, any move away from that squeeze, that is any move that relaxes those income tests and makes care more broadly available, reduces that net care cost is a good move. Um, the, the end of that spectrum, I suppose, uh, would be universal free childcare. So I, I guess the reason, there's a couple of reasons why I would, I want to push for a start for us to make sure we have that option on the table as part mm -hmm. of our policy, uh, you know, matrix, uh, if you like. I think it's a very important option for us to consider as a society as a whole. And secondly, uh, it really does solve this means testing problem. Uh, and so anything less than universal care is to some extent a compromise. We will still have some uh, disincentive effects in the system in terms of net care costs for some households. So we need to bear that into account. The other way that I would um, think about universal childcare is that, you know, we, we have had in this country for a hundred years, maybe longer, uh, universal primary school education. Uh, and uh, we see this as a basic right of children uh, uh, and a basic element of our social compact. Uh, in fact, there's been some interesting recent work just released recently about the idea that uh, even private primary schools, we should be somehow making these available free, right, to our children. Uh, essentially, we're making them public if we do that. Um, so, 
in my view, it is now time for us to think more broadly about childcare, pre-5 uh, care, uh, in that universal way, as a part of our societal public good uh, that we deliver to all children. But we need to, and we've moved that way with kindergarten, uh, already, four-year-old kinder and three-year-old kinder in some states, a certain number of universal hours available. The trouble with the kindergarten policy is that it is not designed to deal with women's workforce participation. It's delivering those benefits to, to children, but in hours which are really not supporting women's work. Uh, so I would be advocating universal care because it kicks both of those things. The child wellbeing uh, point and that universal benefit for our society as a whole and the women's workforce participation goal. And Emma, welcome to you. I, I know you're concerned not to leave all the heavy lifting here to government. What role should employers have in increasing workforce participation among women? Mm. Thanks, Paul, and, and great to be here. I'm just so supportive and you know, certainly encouraged that we're talking about policy design and really taking it by the horns this time, really examining and reimagining what's needed because there is no doubt that things are radically changing and we know the system we have now just isn't fit for purpose. In fact, before COVID, even, you know, children and families, you know, living in poverty is on the rise. We know that inequality is on the rise and we know that childcare was unaffordable for, you know, and continues to be for many families. And this pandemic has really left parents without any predictable means of care that they can afford and rely on. Um, so many are juggling work and, and home caring and, you know, just trying to keep their jobs. And I really feel for a lot of the families, obviously, in Victoria and other places where they're in lockdown, that's incredibly difficult. Um, as a small business owner um, with children over the years, I've certainly been felt the crippling effect of the cost of care over the years. And I've watched my employees struggle with it as well. And, you know, even though as a workplace, we offer a huge amount of flexible work, um, you know, we're a small, small business, all women employed, um, and it's just been part of our DNA, but no amount of flexibility can help you find affordable quality childcare. You know, we've almost lost employees because they haven't been able to, you know, the prohibitive costs of it. And I've had to step in and support um, at times. So I think it does take a village to raise a child. And that means everyone has a role to play in raising and educating our future generation. Um, we all have a vested interest in ensuring that Australian kids have the best start in life, um, certainly from a health perspective, but also educational outcomes. And I think we need to recognise, you know, to, to solve for this, that it isn't an individual's problem alone to access quality, affordable childcare. It's a shared problem. That includes government and business coming to the party alongside families and communities to address this. And I think that's made incredibly difficult here because Australia doesn't actually have a national work and family policy framework unlike other OECD European nations in particular, who use this framework really to invest in family policies such as paid parental leave and childcare to advance workforce participation and improve gender equality. And so without such a framework, we really lack the ability to drive and change what's needed through government in workplaces, in communities, to really deliver good outcomes for families and ultimately the wider nation. Um, so there is no doubt that Australia's current approach to funding early childcare education relies on the lion's share of the burden being felt and shouldered by the individual as their problem to source, fund and invest in quality care for their kids, right? Um, and increasingly, year on year, that gets harder as the costs go up and it becomes prohibitive. And we know that that comes at the expense of women's careers um, in particular and, and children's wellbeing. Um, you know, on top of that, we penalise employers who try to assist um, with subsidising care by labelling it as a benefit and we slap them with FBT. So, you know, from my perspective, childcare isn't a benefit or nice to have. It's an essential service uh, for many workplaces, in fact, to operate. So um, I would add that my, I guess my concern with a universal free childcare is that we outsource the problem entirely to government to solve for. And in that way, you know, it effectively lets perhaps employers off the hook completely. There's no skin in the game for them to, or a real incentive to invest in workplace policies that really deliver better family, work and family outcomes. We effectively say to employers, well, really, it's not your problem to solve for. Um, and so, you know, we just don't see them 
really supporting employees when they become parents. And, you know, that really limits workforce participation opportunities hugely. So, um, yeah, I, I guess it's a shared problem that we, and we all have skin in the game and it should matter to all of us to solve for. Thanks, Emma. Can I just play devil's advocate just for a minute here, um, Danielle? What would you say to the suggestion that your report seems to place a greater value on parents who are in paid work rather than parents who may choose to stay home to raise their children? What do you say to parents who make a conscious decision to stay home rather than rush to get back into the paid workforce? I, I certainly don't think we're putting the values in that way you suggest. I mean, we, we made actually a very um, conscious decision in the report that whenever we're talking about employment, um, we call it paid work, not just work, because we're, we're very conscious of the fact that, um, you know, staying home to, to mind a child is both um, hard work and, and complex um, work. So I think we need to be really careful around that. Um, what we were getting to in the report was really about choice and we were pointing to a world in which both policies and social norms, social, social norms reinforced by policies, um, are pushing families into certain patterns of work. Um, so, for example, we had a lot of survey evidence in the report showing that a lot of women would like to work more but do not do so because of the, the cost of care being so prohibitive. Um, obviously, you know, some of those numbers that I just put up <laughs> when, when you're working um, effectively for free, um, you know, that is very much policy pushing or limiting the set of choices that, that families have. So, you know, we really focus on that idea of opening up the choice set. And, you know, that's where some of the um, overseas examples in the report I thought were particularly powerful. If we look at, um, there's the example of Quebec, where they introduce $5 a day Childcare, we saw you know really big rise in female workforce participation in that province. Um, you know much stronger than than the rest of Canada. Um, Washington DC introduced um, early childhood um, education. Essentially, they were very focused on that point Miranda was going to about the benefits for children's education. But a really significant unexpected side benefit was that uh, a lot more women were participating in the workforce. So you know. The choice set is very responsive to policy, and I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, the other point I'd just really like to, to drive home, and I, you know, I don't want it to be missed, is a point about women's economic security. Um, mm -hmm. One of the most um, surprising numbers for me in the report was we looked at lifetime earnings for, for men and women with and without children. We took the case of a 25-year-old man today and a 25-year-old woman today and projected forward based on current patterns of earnings growth and, and work patterns. Uh, and what we found is that if that 25 year old woman goes on to have a child, she can expect to earn $2 million less over her lifetime than that man if he has a child. Um, that of course um, wouldn't matter so much if um, you know, everyone was in a couple or everyone was in a couple that stayed together, but we know that's not the world we're in. Um, there were some pretty, um, striking statistics in there about the financial stress that women face in the event of divorce. Um, there was a Brotherhood of Lawrence, St. Lawrence report that was released a couple of years ago, which has really stayed with me, which was um, interviewing older women in poverty. And the message that came out from a lot of them was, you know, I, I did what, you know, I thought society expected of me. I gave up work. I was a great wife. I was a great mother. You know, I invested all this and now I've come out and the other side of this in a really precarious financial situation. Um, so, you know, I think that is something we should always think about as well. And I don't, you know, think an ideal policy is a policy that's putting women at risk of that situation. And Emma, from your perspective, where, where does the stay at home parent fit into this policy discussion? Yeah, it's really good it, it, um, because we need to have this conversation about really valuing parenting you know, as, as I said, you know, it, it does take a village to raise a child. We all have to have the opportunity that is needed if we're, if we're parents to lean into the caring and do that what is right for our family and what they need and um, be supported to make those choices. I think this is about 
making sure that people have the right opportunities back into work if that's what they choose and not to have a whole lot of barriers put in front that really prevent them from doing that. So, for example, if we know that we've got a barrier of childcare or, or not enough flexibility, um, you know, obviously that's another key driver where, you know, mothers in particular don't feel they're going to get the flexibility they need to prioritise family as well as work. Um, they all act as a disincentive from really to go, well, you know what, I'll just stay at home because actually probably my kids need me. Um, so I think this is about opening up pathways for choice around um, what works and making sure that we, um, you know, value the fact that, you know, it, parenting takes time and quality investment to do it. And, and that burden too should not sit with the individual um, mother at home. And it's really important that she doesn't feel that that is her entire job to do alone. Uh, and so that means, you know, how do we never have this conversation really about stay at home dads, you know? Yes, yeah, so I was going to just jump in yeah. exactly that, Emma, is if you turned the question around and you said to men, you know, well, we're trying to weigh up this stay at home, you know, your, your children need you at home. I think that really makes that very, very yes. obvious. Um, and that issue of uh, currently the system is weighted towards uh, biased, really, towards uh, a family which has a part-time or full-time parent at mm -hmm. home who is usually the woman. So uh, investing in childcare removes a barrier, uh, which I think Danielle and Emma have said, rather than imposing a new burden um, mm. on kind of the traditional household. Danielle, can I bring the, the, the conversation right to the here and now? You, you say your plan would actually help lift Australia out of this COVID recession, if you like. How would it help in that regard? Yeah, that's, that's an important question, Paul, because a lot of the, the benefits I've been talking about, about um, boosting female workforce participation and productive capacity of the economy are sort of longer term benefits and they sort of apply more when you, you're in a business as usual type world, which is clearly uh, not the world we're in right now. Uh, but we do think there's a very strong case to bring down the cost of childcare in the current environment as well. Um, obviously, we've um, been in quite a disrupted world where it comes to, to childcare policy during COVID. Um, we initially had um, fee-free childcare. We reverted back to, to full, pay, full fees for parents. Uh, two or three weeks ago now, um, we're already hearing anecdotal evidence that some parents are pulling their children out of care. And, you know, quite mm -hmm. frankly, that's not surprising given what we know has happened to jobs and happened to hours of work. Uh, a lot of families just aren't in the position where they can continue to afford care. I'm very worried about the fact that that's probably going to get worse um, at the end of September when Job Seeker and Job Keeper are rolled back, you know, hit family incomes even further. Um, so I think, you know, allowing, you know, cutting the cost of care is incredibly important to allow those families to keep the continuity. It's important for the children um, that they get to stay in care and see their friends and work with the educators that they're used to. And it's really important for, for the parents to have that flexibility. Um, you know, as the labour market starts to improve, um, you want them to, to have stable care so that they can pick up hours as they become available. Um, the other point I would make is a, is a more macro level point. You know, it's really important actually for the, the long term sustainability of the sector as well. Um, so the economics of the sector is that it really relies on utilisation. It needs to have centres operating at a certain capacity. Um, if parents start to pull their kids out, um, that throws um, the economics of some centres in doubt and centre closures would be absolutely devastating um, because it would mean that um, families that, that do have work um, mm. then lose care and you know anyone in Victoria who's trying to mind a toddler at the moment while working will tell you um, you know how difficult that proposition is so I think this is incredibly important for the recovery um, the only other point I would make is that you know we, we made the point really strongly in Grattan's recovery book that the next 12 months is vital for government to come in and support the economy through stimulus in a world where we're pulling back the emergency supports. We need to be um, creating economic activity and jobs through through government activity. And I think you know one component of that. Obviously, there's lots of strengths to that, but I think you know putting a bit of extra cash in the hands of families is is not a bad part of a stimulus package. Miranda and and Emma, I'll ask both of you this actually. Josh Frydenberg and before him Peter Costello. 
seem to think that part of the solution here is for the women of Australia to have more babies. Miranda, are our treasurers on to something here? They're in, a, they're in a long line of tradition of pronatalist fertility policy in Australia. Uh, it has some rather unfortunate roots, including in the white Australia policy. So I hope we're, we're not uh, thinking of going back there. Uh, it's an interesting question now, isn't it? So uh, um, I think what COVID-19 has revealed is not only the, the economic challenges domestically, but of course um, has put a, a very substantial limit on migration. Uh, mm. In the short term, uh, Australia has been um, operating uh, on a net inward migration of um, sort of 300,000 plus per year. The statistics vary depending on how you count, count different kinds of visas and, and pathways. Um, uh, it, it, there is an issue of uh, long over the longer term an aging population uh, and potentially needing to to uh, sort of rebalance that. So this question of uh, whether or not we should have more children is a kind of societal question. I think that that's one point where perhaps I would agree with Josh in terms of it is a social, a social question, not just an individual question. Yeah. Um, of course, we want people to have individual freedom in making those choices, but uh, society has an interest in that question. Um, but uh, if, if we're going to do that, uh, so if, if Josh does want us uh, to have more babies, uh, or young women especially to have more babies, I think it's really important to understand that that is a social question uh, and that uh, societal engagement in, it, in supporting and educating uh, those, those, that new generation is critical. And therefore the childcare question is really critical. Uh, I did want to just quickly come back to the stay at home parent question. I feel really yes. privileged myself to have been able to breastfeed my son uh, and then go back to work full time while my partner was part time for a period of, of uh, time. And uh, I think we do need to recognise the extraordinary economic and social and family value of caring uh, for young children. Um, as I say at the moment, the childcare policy is about rebalancing, but we do need to put that policy together with parental leave, which we might talk about shortly, uh, and recognise especially uh, the value of that uh, home labour women's time in infant care. Uh, and so we need both those policies if, if Josh does want us to get to, to have more babies. Indeed. And Emma, is it is it really our civic duty to have more babies? <laughs> I think it's our civic duty to support people who make that choice, actually. Um, look, I, I think absolutely Miranda's right. We've really relied on net migration to support us with this and suddenly it's not there and suddenly it's an issue. What are we going to do about it? And we do, like other countries, have a declining birth rate in Australia. So it's a concern. It is a, definitely a social concern. Um, I think the difference is if we think back to Costello's days, I guess he put his money where his mouth is, to be fair. You know, that's when we had the baby bonus at least was announced. And, you know, he said, yeah, we get it. We've all got to do pitch in here. And for the first time, we saw any kind of contribution made by government towards paid parental leave. We see no such announcement at all from um, Josh Frydenberg at this point. And it's been 10 years since Australia introduced its first paid parental leave national scheme. So obviously that came after the baby bonus. And there's been no improvement really on that at all. Um, and which I find extraordinary considering other nations around the world have a really progressive agenda around it and uh, making sure that both men and women have much more equal access to it, much more flexible access to it. We see no such improvement agenda at all from government at this point. Okay, so paid parental leave, uh, Miranda mentioned it, Emma mentioned it, Danielle, you have some recommendations for government on paid parental leave, just run us through those. Uh, we do, and it really sort of goes to the point that um, Emma was making there about overseas schemes being both um, more generous overall and, and also allowing greater flexibility around um, who takes the leave. So we know that a lot of um, countries, well, one will pay leave at a, a fraction of um, pre-child earnings. Um, we know that we had a go at that in Australia under, under Tony Abbott. Um, Australia is a, a country with a real sort of history of means testing government support. Um, so, you know, we weren't confident that that sort of greater generosity 
in terms of the amount paid was really going to fly here. At the moment, we pay at a flat rate of the minimum wage. Um, so we worked around that model. But the other way they're more generous is often they will have specific leave set aside for the father. Um, and, you know, it's not just, you know, the Nordic countries that we always talk about. There are, um, you know, plenty in our own region, um, Japan and South Korea have incredibly generous parental leave policies for both mothers and fathers. And, you know, there's an interesting um, evidence base that's, that sprung up given that a lot of countries have had these policies in place for quite some time now about, you know, what that actually means for the, the sharing of the unpaid work in the relationship. And, you know, what a lot of that evidence suggests is, you know, when the father takes that role as primary carer early on in the child's life, um, and, you know, they get good at running the household and good at caring for the child, um, you actually do see long-term change in how those um, responsibilities are shared. And obviously, uh, in a world where you have better sharing of unpaid work, there's much more capacity for, for better sharing of, of paid work as well. Um, so we, you know, we really put our childcare recommendation at the centrepiece, but we do think parental leave is an important part of the, the puzzle as well. Um, essentially what we recommended is rather than the 18 weeks for the primary carer, 99.8% um, I think is taken by women, uh, and, and two weeks dad and partner leave um, that we have a, a more generous scheme, which would be six, pay, six weeks of paid leave for each parent and then 12 weeks to share between them. Um, so if people wanted to, they could essentially go with the current arrangement where the woman or the mother takes the 18 weeks, um, but it does leave then an additional six weeks for the father. So important uh, time to, to bond in the early year. But if they also were interested in a more equitable distribution, it's much more flexible than the existing arrangements. Um, so it, look, it's a fairly um, modest proposal. It would cost about $700 million a year, um, but you know, I think it would be a good place to start. And you, know, you could certainly look at, um, monitor the effects of that and you know, maybe think about ramping it up over time. Miranda, what do you think of Grattan's modest proposal and how would you reform pay parental leave? Oh, look, you know, clearly I'm uh, known for making ambit claims. They're not ambit claims, though. They're serious policy proposals. I think it's too modest, um, but it is in the right direction. Um, I would, and, and, and perhaps this is something on which minds can differ. I, I would, uh, there's plenty of evidence that um, maternal infant care and breastfeeding in particular are, have very good long-term benefits for children and mothers uh, and for women's health as well as infant health. Uh, and so, again, while without forcing any woman to breastfeed her child or without mandating these things, what I would like to do is remove the barriers uh, and provide as much support as possible. We have very low levels of breastfeeding relative to, for example, Canada uh, in Australia. So what that really does require is that the, the mother primarily does get that first six months of, of parental leave uh, because it just takes so much time. Uh, and that's the reality. Mm. Now, it is possible to work and also breastfeed, and women do it uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, uh, and so that could also be done. And I like Emma's comments about employer engagement, especially in these sorts of things. But I also think that probably we are not going to be able to change the culture uh, of uh, shared parent care, especially male care of children, unless we mandate uh, leave uh, for men. I, I, I really it seems impossible to change employer culture as well as uh, a discrimination against men who take leave to look after children. And so I would like to see uh, a chunk of leave directed at uh, the second parent, usually the man, um, to take mm. up that, that leave from the employer. Um, um, Emma's nodding, I would pass on to her on that point. Yes, look, my favourite topic. <laughs> um, look, we have been working alongside Corporate Australia to improve um, paid parental leave benefits. What's uh, interesting about Australia's approach to it is because government was late to the party on any kind of national scheme, it meant that employers from the early 90s really got much more involved in coming up with a scheme uh, around paid parental leave and recognising that they had a role to play. I always find this really interesting because there's a recognition there's a role to play often in paid parental leave, but somehow there's this imaginary line that's drawn when it comes to childcare. Oh, no, that's not our thing. Um, we'll contribute towards paid parental leave, but childcare we're not, it's not going to get involved in. Um, so, but with paid parental leave, um, because it's been in place for a period of time, 
um, and employers have seen and, and leaned into a role of it, they've started to design their own schemes, at, you know, at the lack of any kind of progress um, from government in, in particular in the last 10 years on improvement. And we know that the organisations that have put in place equal paid parental leave, so for example, 18 weeks for men, 18 weeks for women, regardless of who's the primary carer, have seen an extraordinary uplift of men taking the leave. Um, and, you know, that has been because these organisations have um, really invited men into the conversation. They've really um, spoken out loudly about the benefit of taking the leave and really encouraged them to do it, really invited them in and removed a lot of the policy barriers. So um, a lot of people, you know, do challenge me on this and go, but men, are they really interested in taking parental leave? And the answer is yes, they are. And, you know, that they want to be invited into this, but they too have barriers um, that we've put in in place and you know things like describing um, carers as primary or secondary really relegates dad to the you know side hustle job of secondary carer right and so as a result you know they don't feel that they've got necessarily um, an opportunity to take on an equal share um, that really their role is to support the fin family financially um, and so we perpetuate the problem so um, but we've got, as I said, lots of evidence with corporate Australia that have introduced gender equal paid parental leave that it works, that we do have more men leaning in and taking it. And in some cases, they've actually shared their story of what it's meant for them and their family. I've you know, heard of stories where um, the partner of a male, for example, that's taken um, the leave where his wife might have actually written into the CEO of that company saying, this is how it's changed our life. Um, and they are, um, were really unexpected positive consequences that we had. And, and those women really talked about what it meant for their career and how they've been able to, um, you know, get back to work, but also what it's provided to their husbands or partners around their ability to bond and be involved. So if you like, we've been running a mini experiment in corporate Australia. It's working. And, you know, we should be thinking about, right, how do we mainstream that? Because not every employer can obviously afford to give such a generous scheme. Um, so, Emma, this goes exactly to what a lot of the questions that are coming in from our um, viewers are about. Um, Julie makes the point rather nicely that um, the elephant in the room here is blokes. Let's talk a bit more about blokes. Tell me, Emma, what more should governments and employers do to better support fathers to help mothers return to work? Yeah, well, I think put simply, make it gender equal. I think men need to have an equal share of leave allocated to them. Until we do that, you know, they are going to be considered, as I said, a side hustle job, um, that they're not important. That's what we communicate. Um, and at the moment, the Australian government policy around parental leave says that mums are the primary carers, you know. And so until, again, we start to look at really getting rid of those kind of labels, we're not going to see a change. So I would agree. I, I like where the Grattan Institute is going with its paid parental leave, but I'd like it to go much further. We know that the average is 50 weeks. Um, there's a few colleagues um, of mine who spent a lot of time in parental leave policy who like the Iceland model, which is, you know, three months for mum, three months for dad and three months to share. Mm -hmm. um, they too have had some really great uplift in women's workforce participation and interestingly can show the decline when it's taken away because during the GFC they took it away for such a generous scheme and they saw a significant decline. So we know that it can, and then they've turned it back on again and it's gone back up. So we, we know that it can work uh, and, it, and it's worth investing in. And uh, it, as I said, it makes for a more equal society around sharing the care. So I want to see a shared paid parental leave scheme in Australia. Okay, so I'm going to run around the panel as best I can with a range of questions from you, our audience. There's lots of them, so I'll do my best to get through as many as I can. I'll start with you, Danielle. This is a question from Thomas. Is COVID-19 moving us backwards by putting extra care responsibilities on women as schools shut down? Or is it moving us forwards through much more working from home? 
uh, the answer is more of the former. There is a little bit of the latter. So if we look at the, the time use data, uh, both men and women are doing more unpaid work uh, because of um, home, we're not allowed to call it homeschooling, are we? Remote learning. Um, and uh, now in, in Victoria, at least, the closure of childcare centres as, as they were in many other places in the world. So we see um, men are doing more and, and they're probably, um, the, the, the load of unpaid care is more visible but women are still doing disproportionately more on top of that. So um, to, it has um, actually substantially increased the unpaid burden on women. Um, and I think there's a really interesting question about what that means longer term. Um, the, you know, one of the first papers I saw on this came out of academia and it's one of those professions where you actually kind of have an objective measure of productivity in terms of the number of journal articles you submit and, and the early data suggested that um, men were submitting as many if not more uh, articles than they were in a pre-COVID world uh, whereas women's um, submissions just dropped through the floor um, and I, I suspect um, you know that's just a very small microcosm but you know that's mirroring what we're seeing um, across society so I'm I'm worried about it. Um, it's great that men have taken on more, but you know, women are still doing the lion's share of that additional caring and that you know, potentially will have significant long-term ramifications for their, for their career and their progression. Miranda, I'm going to put this one to you. This is from Elise. Elise says, women fought for the right to work. Should we expect men to fight for the right to take on care responsibilities? Oh, well, it would be nice to see men doing that. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we're in a world where if women actually want to fully achieve the right to work that we have fought for, we're going to have to mandate these other forms of societal change. Um, if you think about the, the 70s, uh, so let's say nearly 50 years ago now, and second wave feminism, when you look at the workforce statistics of women and men in Australia, women's workforce participation, of course, has in increased quite significantly since then. Uh, across the population, pretty much all of that increase is in part-time work. So, uh, you know, there were women working full-time in the 70s, uh, either in managerial roles, in teaching roles, or in uh, manufacturing roles, right, across the board. Uh, uh, and there were women, uh, a large proportion of women not working at all when they had children in particular. Uh, so we've seen a change there, but we still have uh, actually a long way to go and we are two generations down the track. Uh, so the purpose of these reforms, uh, I think, is actually uh, to support uh, women's still active economic participation. Um, Paul, I, I wanted to just go back to one COVID thing, uh, what, one yeah. thing which is sort of reflects an issue that we haven't mentioned yet in the broader childcare world, and that is that there's an awful lot of informal care that is done in our society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Families rely, you know, in particular on grandparents, but also on other informal care arrangements. And I think the, the stat statistics are that it's about 30% of families that rely perhaps for a day or more a week on informal care, grandparental care. Um, of course, that has many positives, right? Family connection, intergenerational connection, and so on. COVID-19 puts a real spanner in the works for informal care, mm -hmm. because we know that older people are especially at risk, uh, and especially in a lockdown situation as we are in Melbourne. But in the longer term, uh, that informal care is, is going to be less available to coming generations of young women. Uh, older generations, such as my generation, are working, generations older than myself will eventually be unavailable to provide that informal care. And so we're going to hit a crunch. And one of the purposes of policy is to think strategically and to try to deliver that societal support, uh, you know, for that 30% of care that, that is the gap being filled. Good mm. point, Miranda. Very good point, Miranda. I've got, a, I've got a really good question from Jess, which I'm going to put briefly to each of the panel. Jess says, I'm starting to try to have kids. What advice would you give me about how to prepare for that in a professional sense? <laughs> and I'll start with you, Danielle. Uh, look, that's a great question. Um, so look, I think 
you should sit down if you have a partner and um, have a pretty open chat about how you're going to share those responsibilities. Um, so I was um, keen if I was going to go back to work um, part time after my daughter was born that my partner would do the same. Um, and yeah, that was quite important to me that we sort of take a very active stance early on of, of you know, sharing and doing um, an equal amount of the unpaid work. So I think you've, you've really got to consciously um, address that. Um, hopefully you have an employer that, um, you know, has parental leave, embraces flexible work, hopefully your partner does as well. Um, and I would just be, you know, trying to push as much as possible for um, a fair sharing of the unpaid care so that you can then share the paid work and, um, you know, both keep a, a toe in the water in terms of your professional life. Miranda, Jess is a professional woman soon to start having children, she hopes. What would you say to Jess? Well, that's exciting. There's a lot you can't prepare for. <laughs> we just have to, surprise. Uh, but anyway, uh, leaving that issue aside, I, look, I support Danielle's comments. You might want to have those negotiations with your employer if you can. Uh, I, I was in, I'm inspired by Emma's stories about paid parental leave and the need to approach your employer. So maybe she would have some advice on that. I feel very privileged. I mean, we end up in anecdotes, don't we? But I feel very privileged that my son was able to go to really an excellent childcare centre uh, close to, to work for, for a long period of time, for a number of years. It was a really enriching experience. And uh, finding that is not always easy, but uh, I, I think it's highly valuable for the child and the family. Um, Emma, any thoughts for Jess? Yes, I remember when this was me, Jess, um, for me 14 years ago, and I welcomed twins first. So this was always <laughs> going to be a challenge. I was terrified. Um, not only of how I was going to manage twins, but largely how I was going to manage work because I knew we relied on our income. And I loved my work and I really wanted to think about how I was going to keep both. And I, and I remember feeling that I shouldn't have to feel like I have to make a choice. I should be able to work and not do so at the sacrifice of my children and their well-being. And so um, my, I sat down at the time and really thought about, I've got to start this as I mean to continue. Like, what is my vision for where I'm going with my work? What do I really love? And what do I want to make sure that I can go, you know, that I'm going to go back to, I'm going to want to go back to that. Um, and really think about, you know, obviously your economic situation as well. I, I had to go back. Um, so really thinking about how I could best make that work for me. Um, and then obviously really, um, so that starts with a bit of a design and a vision around, you know, what is it that I want this to look like? And obviously having that conversation with your partner, doing the numbers, can't tell you how important it is to do the numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm not a numbers person. So that was confronting because I knew they weren't pushy and it was going to cost. And for a long time, it did take me some, you know, I had to really swallow the cost every time I forked out a lot of money for childcare. Um, so have a vision, really think about how you want to share, share that and have those critical conversations with, you know, the people around you that are really going to influence the outcome here, your partners, your family, and obviously your workplace. Thank you. Another one for each of the panel, I think. This is a big question. This is perhaps the big question. And it comes from Emma, a viewer called Emma. What is the effect of patriarchal culture on women's workforce participation? Danielle? Gosh, that's a nice big one. Um, look, I, th I think it probably, um, I'll, I'll tackle one angle of this. There's obviously a very big question, but uh, it absolutely manifests in some of the decisions we see or some of the attitudes of employers that we see. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about childcare, we've talked about parental leave, um, flexible work is obviously the other kind of big piece of this puzzle. Um, we saw in the data that we looked at that overwhelmingly it's women that choose to work flexibly, or I should say both ask and get accepted to work flexibly, particularly part-time work. Um, and what we know is that even if fathers would like to work flexibly, um, often they just face a lot more barriers in doing so. Um, so they're more likely to be rejected by their employer. They're more likely to be judged negatively by their peers. Um, and that is because of those patriarchal assumptions that the, you know, the, that the husband will have a wife at home to do that. You know, why are they trying to take on 
those roles. So I think um, there does, and this is why I think policy is important. As you start to nudge people, as people start to shift, norms change, expectations change, and all of that gets eroded. But at the moment, while those attitudes are still there, um, you know, the fact that you hear from young men that take parental leave to be the primary carer, that they, you know, get snide comments from their bosses or their, their colleagues um, is still a very real deterrent from them doing that and doing what they want to do, which is take a more active role in their child's life. Miranda, what do you think is the patriarchy the problem here, the root of the problem? Patriarchy. Wow, second wave feminism. Um, <laughs> look, I, I think that uh, yes, the, uh, in a sense, the answer is yes. But what I would be wanting to do, I guess, is that we we, we should be living in a society where we value and respect um, every individual across their life course. Uh, and what we have at the moment is a set of policies or institutions that interact in such a way that we still undervalue women's uh, working economic security and decision-making kind of capabilities. Um, and so we want to, again, this, this idea of pulling care out of the home into the societal context is one way of engaging all of us in that discussion equally. Uh, the political philosopher Martha Nussbaum wrote in a development context, talking about developing countries, uh, that, um, when we think about individual capabilities and human rights, uh, we, we all need to think about the cost of care as a fundamental problem. And we still don't do that. Uh, mm. And so that would be my advocacy, is that that would be the way in order to value women's lives uh, the same way that we value men's lives in society. Mm. Emma, the, culture, the sort of cultural foundations of this issue that we're discussing. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, if we look back the last 100 years and we look at the role of women in society and how many, um, you know, how that's evolved and changed and, it's, you know, it's been radically um, challenged, hasn't it? I'm just not sure that we've done that for men, you know, and I think men have really continued to be shackled to this breadwinner role and not capable of caregiving. And we have to really challenge that. You know, men are entirely capable um, of being caregivers. They want to be caregivers. I, don't, I haven't met a single man yet who I know has taken some time off to, or, you know, whether it be on a regular basis or a one-off basis, to take care and be there for their kids that they've regretted it. They just don't, you know. Um, they only have positive stories to say, even if they did encounter snide comments um, or, you know, discrimination. Resoundedly, they come back and say it's the best thing they've ever done is to take that time. Um, so we have to really challenge what it means um, for men, um, you know, what their role in society really is, is about and really help them explore and lean into um, their caregiving opportunities that are there for them and we have to really encourage that and design policy that permits that and at the moment we do not have that. I've got a related question from Rosine which again I'll put to each of you briefly if I may. I like this question too. How do we encourage leadership in women who work limited hours? Let me start with you again Danielle. Uh, one I think we need to change our frame of what a what a leader looks like and there are plenty of ways that you can lead while working part-time I think we can also be a little bit more creative around this space um, so I certainly know uh, at my former employer there are um, quite a number of um, quite senior leadership roles where they are now job shared um, where you have two people um, doing that role part-time I've I even saw one <laughs> recently where um, Two, two women actually responded to an ad for a leadership role as a, as a package deal. So as in they applied and they'd worked together mm. previously and they said, you know, we're, we're applying, we'll both work part-time, they knew each other. I mean, obviously there's challenges in, in doing that. Um, you have to be able to coordinate with that person and work well with them. But I've seen enough examples of that working now to think that, you know, ideas like that may well be the future and the way that we solve some of these difficult conundrums. <laughs> Miranda, is that the sort of flexibility that we can realistically look forward to? 
I think that's very interesting and I think it can certainly work in um, structured employment environments, especially larger employers where you can identify actually what is the role and divide that up. And um, But I would also urge, you know, I, it's, it's not for everybody, but I, I, would, I would like to create a world where uh, women or everyone as individuals, but women have had less of an opportunity can actually choose to dedicate their lives for a period of years to something, you know, in a focused way, uh, whether that's being a leader or being an artist or being, a, you know, the thing that you're passionate about. And I think one thing we need to remember is that we, we live very long lives at the moment mm. in society. Uh, and we, we don't want to look just uh, in a single year, uh, you know, at the age of 25, or at the age of 30. What we need to be thinking about to extend this care discussion, written, focusing on childcare, because that's really critical for, for women's life course wellbeing, uh, is that uh, we should be able to move in and out of leadership roles um, with others. So sharing that leadership over time, not just in the one moment. Mm. Um, and um, we should be able to manage the care of our families and older people together with society whilst moving in and out of those focused roles. So I'd be looking more on a life course of that basis, I think. Emma, I can see you nodding. Well, I was just thinking when you become a parent, my goodness, you, that's where you hone your leadership skills. <laughs> no, really, um, you know, obviously the negotiation, the grappling with uncertainty and ambiguity and things always changing. You know, um, parents have a unique ability to learn a skill to look after another human life. And, and if that's not one of the most important leadership skills you can learn that you could then apply in a workplace, I don't know what is. And I, and I think we need to, yeah, appreciate that skill. Um, and that we, when we, um, we bring that leadership um, knowledge that we've gained um, back into the workplace. And that's a wonderful thing. And uh, but sometimes we see, as so this comes back to how we value parenting, that that's just not really an important job. They're just, you know, changing nappies and breastfeeding and there's not a lot really going on. And, um, and, and then over here, well, that's work, that's where really important stuff and decisions have to be made. But I would say there's life, you know, decisions that are being made in parenting every single day around a child's well-being, And that doesn't happen necessarily at the same rate in workplaces where they're making life and death decisions, obviously, depending on your occupation. Um, so we learn these leadership skills when we become parents. We have to recognise that as individuals and we have that to bring into a workplace. Um, and, you know, that is really going to make us, you know, prepared for any future leadership role, I think, in, in many organisations. Now, we're getting, unfortunately, we're getting very close to time, but I want to finish by asking each of you to gaze into the future and to describe a better future for all of us. Firstly, to you, Danielle, I'll put it this way. What do you hope is the picture of female workforce participation in Australia by the time your young daughter is entering the workforce? Great question. Um, look, I think I would hope it, has been, it would be the world that um, I think Miranda and Emma have painted beautifully for us uh, in, the, in their answers, which is a world in which decision to have a child and the decision to go to work um, doesn't put the costs purely on her, um, whether that's in terms of childcare, the additional unpaid load, the, the career advancement penalty, where we've recognised that, um, you know, children are there for society um, and then there is a better sharing of that load um, through better childcare policy, through better parental leave policy, through more flexible work for both men and women. Um, you know, I think that would be a, a great vision for her future. Miranda, briefly, can we look forward to a, a better world for our sons and daughters? You know, in the year when COVID-19 arrived, it's really not a good year to be asking us to predict the future, Paul. <laughs> um, well, I think the main thing we can predict is that there will be risks and crises that we can't predict. Um, but having, having said that, yes, look, obviously I would like a, a, a society where uh, we do make those uh, decisions and we do share those costs of care in order to develop the most well-being out of each of us in Australia as individuals, if we want to put a national frame on it. We could talk about the world. but uh, And um, 
Australians, you know, we say we love our freedom. And one of the ironies of delivering public goods to all, including childcare, primary education, good health, is that that frees us to make choices uh, as women and men. Uh, and so I would be hoping for a society where, uh, you know, the next generation is a enabled to, to have that freedom by that decision of us as a society to share those costs. Emma, leave us on an upbeat note. Are you confident <laughs> that things will get better? Yes, I, you know, I am because, you know, here we are having a discussion today, which I think, um, you know, if COVID hadn't hit, maybe we wouldn't be having in such a robust way. We're kind of forced to make this change, whether we like it or not. Um, I, I do think we need government to do the heavy lifting and we need to incentivise employers to contribute to to creating family, work and family policy, right, that works. I think, I hope that we do from this develop a work and family policy framework in Australia that which can underpin all these things. And we're not off tinkering with paid parental over, leave over here and, you know, childcare policy over here that, and, and domestic family and violence policy over here, that they, they are all part of what it means to, to really value work and family and understand where the two come together. Um, family should not be paying um, more for childcare than they do for a mortgage, which is actually where people are at. Um, and look, on a personal note, I really hope my sons enter a world where they get equal paid parental leave benefit and they're permitted to care equally for their children um, as, as is their spouse. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Danielle. And thank you to our host and partner, the State Library of Victoria and to you, our audience members. I hope you found today's webinar valuable. If you have, please let your friends and colleagues know that they will soon be able to watch it on Grattan's website and social media channels. Please keep in touch with Grattan Institute and State Library of Victoria via our websites. Wash your hands, keep your distance and thanks for watching.